as we uh, as we once discussed with you, you know, in one of our interviews or, or one of our conversations, that uh, Putin and his Kremlin they uh, controls the narrative. So basically, any time he was able to pronounce victory and say, "Oh, you know, we." achieved our goals in Ukraine, you know, we took the, over these or we took over that, you know, we control whatever, you know, Mariupol, whatever left from Mariupol, the Russians totally destroyed, or whatever left from, you uh, know, Papasna, Sever Danielsons are also totally evaporated and destroyed cities. He, he, he had this possibility to stop it before it went that bad. Why didn't he do that? Was he misled by his military guy, by his KGB guy, or why? Well, um, he, uh, he wanted to get more land. He, at some point, as you rightly said, was misled by people around him. He thought that he would be able to get uh, farther. And the more land he gets, the more popular he will be at home, the more victorious he will, he will be. And uh, I think for you and me, if he grabs more land, he doesn't seem to be more successful. He just seems to be more brutal. But there are people in Russia who care about uh, imperial, uh, imperial uh, successes. There are people in Russia who want to grab more land. And these people actually will criticize Putin now because as we speak, he's losing land, not gaining land. And so that's another mistake. Indeed, uh, the, uh, the optimal behavior would be once you lose uh, Kyiv Oblast, uh, Kyiv region, Sumer region, part of Kharkiv region from initial assault, probably you want to dig in and defend whatever you gained otherwise. Some military experts would say that with uh, high Mars arriving, uh, the uh, uh, the other side of Dnieper is not defensible. So Kherson and land around that is simply not defensible because uh, bridges can be targeted. And so Russian uh, army there on the uh, right side of uh, the river, you know, that um, in, in, in Dnieper goes from north to south. So uh, if you look at the map, the left side is called the uh, right side, actually. Right bank uh, uh, part of Dnieper will not be defensible, but the rest could be defended, I guess. But Putin just wanted to push further and further. And as time went by, Ukraine got more and more weapons and they succeeded in pushing back Putin in um, mounting a very successful uh, counteroffensive in Kharkiv region, and this is when Putin needs to decide what he needs, to, what he can do, and this is uh, where we are now. In your spin dictators, you argue that you know these tyrants of the twenty first century, their uh, power is based on the popular support, and for that, in order to control this popular support, they control media. They don't, they don't allow for independent media to exist so that, you know, they will be able to control uh, uh, the narrative about them and the achievements or failures, you know, in each step of the way and etc. But, you know, here we are, Putin uh, on, um, uh, on September 21st, he announced mobilization, basically uh, something that happened two times before in the Russian history. One, you know, at the, uh, at the verge of the Great War, and another one in 1941, uh, you know, when Nazi Germany invaded Soviet Union and, you know, and uh, Stalin announced mobilization. It's the third time in our history. So he does understand that mobilization, you know, this draft of, you know, who, uh, of uh, male population age 18, uh, to 55 is going to hurt his constituency. Why did he go for that? Doesn't he understand? That, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a legitimate question. And uh, this is uh, the question which I can only answer in the following way. He is no longer a spin dictator. He, as I mentioned, moved back in time and mobilization is exactly what Stalin would do and exactly what Stalin did. And uh, it's uh, in some ways maybe compared to collectivization when Stalin actually forced uh, 
peasants to work for free, creating pretty much an enslaved agricultural uh, industry. Uh, this is this is what uh, fear dictators do. This is what 20th century dictators do. Why Putin did that? The answer is very simple. He didn't want to do that as long as he could. So for months, he delayed this mobilization, understanding that it will not be popular. Why did he eventually went for this? Because his previous strategy stopped working. His previous strategy was he recruited soldiers and paid them. So he would send his um, lieutenants to poor regions of Russia and to Russian prisons, and they would pay 10 times the average salary in the region and uh, recruit soldiers and send them to Ukraine. But now he's running out of money. He had a huge budget deficit in July, substantial budget deficit in August. He is facing a major problem in December when uh, European oil embargo will kick in and also G7 plus EU oil price cap will start. So even if he sells oil to non-European countries, to India and China, they will not pay him the market price. They will pay him whatever America will tell them to pay, like $50 per barrel. So Putin will run low on cash. And so for him now, in order to finish this war before December, which I don't think he's going to manage, but uh, for him to be able to send soldiers to, to Ukraine, he needs to grab them for free. And that's why mobilization. And indeed, his problem with soldiers is really, really uh, huge. So if you think about this idea that he needs to go to prisons to recruit criminals who are not great soldiers, they're just desperate men. Uh, and uh, uh, his uh, emissary, Evgeny Prigozhin, uh, proudly said to those uh, criminals that I will give you freedom, I will also give you money. This is completely illegal, of course, in Russian law, both what Prigozhin is doing running a mercenary operation, but also the fact that criminals are just let out of jail without any paperwork. This is something uh, which shows how desperate uh, Putin's military operation is. And now he understood that he doesn't get enough soldiers. He doesn't have enough money to recruit sufficient number of soldiers. So instead of recruiting people, he just took people for free. A bit like uh, how Stalin simply uh, took grain for free from uh, Soviet peasants. Okay, you know, you said that he did what Stalin did, but I tend to disagree with you. My father was a 21 year old guy you know, in junior in his, uh, you know, some technical university in Moscow. He, and when uh, German, Nazi Germany invaded Soviet Union, he volunteered to the army, even though, you know, students were not drafted back in 1941. And, uh, you know, he spent two weeks in the intelligence school and then he was parachuted on the territory of the Nazi occupied Ukraine, by the way. So, but you know, he did it when I was asking him, you know, dad, why you were doing this? After all, you know, Stalin was a dictator and you were a Jew who was parachuted uh, on the territory of, the, uh, of Ukraine after already by the year happened. So, and he said, because, you know, I was defending my, my mom, my mom and dad, I was defending my sister, I was defending my country, my motherland. Don't you think that it's a little bit different from what Putin is doing now? Who these soldiers are defending? Who are they defending? Yes, I, They're going to go, they are going to, they are sent to kill Ukrainians, that's it. I, I agree with you that uh, in uh, 1941, the situation was different because the enemy was actually trying to exterminate whole nations and enslave others. So in that sense, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're right. Uh, you also know that in some parts of Soviet Union, people thought that between these two dictators, uh, actually Germany is better than uh, Soviet Union. But in any event, for a Jewish person, of course, that was no question because Hitler was very clear what his plans are uh, for uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish residents throughout Europe. So in that sense, I'm not surprised. He also was very clear what he would do with the uh, Communist Party members. So for Communist Party members, that was also another question. So of course, it was a completely different war. The war today 
is in a sense different uh, because uh, this is Russia which is invading. And you're right that uh, soldiers are mobilized to be sent to Ukraine to die for nothing, for things that uh, that are not uh, are not really related to anything related to good and evil. It's just pure evil. So and uh, and uh, probability of getting killed is very high. So in the last half a year, probably Russian army lost. Uh, one third or one half of initial con uh, contingent uh, killed or wounded, and these were the best the best units of Russian army. The mobilized units are less well trained, are uh, uh, certainly less well motivated. Ukraine is much better armed right now by, uh, including by American um, uh, lethal uh, lethal equipment, and so I think the probability of surviving that. For mobilized man is really really low. So I I I think I think uh, these people once they understand what's going on, they will probably try to run away. Uh, a student of yours, and uh, just for the audience, I will remind that Sergey Gori was the dean of the best advanced economic school ever existed in Russia, Russian School of Economics. And you know when he had to flee the country when the, uh, Putin initiated a criminal case, uh, a criminal investigation against him and some uh, other academics. Uh, but, you know, uh, so one of your students, you know, one uh, Maxim Mironov, currently professor of the Madrid School uh, Business School, uh, and uh, uh, another professor of UCLA, Alek Tzhoki, they just published a paper in accordance with which uh, they, 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 uh, to their estimate, the probability of uh, dying, of be, getting killed in the war in Ukraine is extremely high. In fact, they suggest uh, judging, they, you know, judging by the uh, amount of dead uh, happened among this, you know, the, the conscripts uh, drafted people in uh, Lugansk, in Lugansk and Donetsk oblasts. Uh, so basically, they suggested that 66.6% uh, uh, will get killed or wounded. It is to say that out of every 100 drafted, 66.6%, 66 uh, persons are going to get killed or wounded. So it is extreme probability of getting killed. I agree with this estimate, to which extent it's accurate. This is not very accurate. And Maxim and Oleg, Oleg Itzhok is also uh, somebody I taught at the New Economic School when I was in Moscow. And uh, actually, in the beginning of the war, Oleg and I wrote a few op-eds arguing that the West should introduce stuff for sanctions against Russia because that will bring the war to an end sooner. Uh, both Oleg and Maxim emphasize that, of course, their estimates are not very precise because they're based on um, numbers which come from a different uh, stage of this war. They also use estimates of uh, mortality, which are not very, very, um, uh, very precise as well. And so in that sense, uh, these numbers are not precise, but um, the magnitude is probably correct. And uh, the order of magnitude is probably correct. And indeed, if you think about three uh, mobilized soldiers going to the war and only one returning safely, that's a huge, huge uh, risk. And indeed, uh, if uh, any of them is watching us right now, I would suggest to run away whatever, whatever it takes. Because uh, going to war, killing Ukrainians is already bad, but uh, the probability that you yourself will be killed or wounded is extremely high. However, if you read the Ukrainian press, uh, which also, of course, you know, and blogs which discuss, uh, you know, this uh, draft in Russia and the fact that uh, hundreds of thousands of male are running away from Russia, they're very skeptical in their analysis. They basically say, why do these male run away from Russia, whether they have to go and take over Kremlin, kill Putin, and uh, free Russia uh, from the yoke. What would you respond to that? What would be your response to that? Well, I, it's very hard to judge people 
uh, both people in Ukraine who are suffering and are calling for overthrowing of Putin, but also it's hard to judge people in Russian society who run away from the war. Not everybody can fight, and uh, I myself, I would not uh, be able to fight myself uh, uh, as well. I'm a peaceful person. I don't know how I can get a gun and kill somebody. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure um, we can judge uh, either of those groups of people. And uh, I would just say, every single Russian man who runs away from the draft reduces death in Ukraine reduces the uh, number of Ukrainians killed and the uh, number of uh, Ukrainian houses destroyed. And in that sense, uh, every Russian who manages to escape the draft contributes to safety of Ukraine. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Vladimir Putin, while announcing this draft on September, on September 21st, he also said that he's prepared to whatever, uh, whatever uh, necessary to defend these, so to say, newly acquired territories of the Russian Federation. It was before the end of the referendum that Russian Federation conducted in the occupied territories of Ukraine, where you know, uh, two thirds of the people just already uh, no longer live there. And you know, they conducted this referendum, Russians conducted this referendum using people with the guns. But anyway, and what is, was new in his statement, uh, it was that he said, I'm not bluffing. So do you really believe that Putin is ready to use nuclear weapons? I don't know. I don't know. And uh, whenever a, play, a poker player is bluffing, <laughs> Yeah, whenever, whenever a poker player is bluffing, he says, I'm not bluffing. So if Putin said, um, I'm going to use nuclear weapons, and then he would say, I'm bluffing, uh, that would be uh, strange. So it's normal that a bluffing person also says, I'm not bluffing. So that's okay. But uh, we now know from uh, leaks from American government that American government takes it very seriously takes this uh, takes this potential use of nuclear weapons by Putin very seriously and warned uh, Mr. Putin that the consequences will be grave. I remind you that American government hunted down and killed Osama bin Laden for something which is much less severe, right? And so um, if you compare what uh, Osama bin Laden has done, which is a horrible crime, and what Vladimir Putin is planning to do, and has already accomplished, right? Uh, probably in Mariupol, um, Russia has killed hundreds of thousands of men. Eh? So this is comparable to a nuclear bombing in Japan in 1945. So it's uh, it's something that um, that uh, is much much worse than than Osama bin Laden. And in that sense, if I were Vladimir Putin, I would think many many times over about uh, your own personal safety. Remember that be before the war began, American intelligence was getting very precise information about what's going on within the Kremlin, which probably means that there are people around Putin who work for American intelligence. These people can uh, probably get access to Putin the moment American government believes he's a legitimate target. So uh, I, don't think, I don't think Vladimir Putin is stupid, but he of course can make mistakes. One thing which American government is also suggesting is that they don't believe that uh, one nuclear strike will stop Ukrainian government because Ukrainians have already suffered so much that uh, even another city fully destroyed may not, uh, may not be enough to stop them. I would also mention another thing. This is something that uh, Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian media are discussing that Russia has plenty of nuclear plant, uh, nuclear power plant stations around, around, uh, around Ukraine within reach of uh, uh, Ukrainian rockets. And uh, in that sense, Ukraine doesn't have nuclear weapons, but uh, they can also sabotage Russian nuclear industry. And so that will be very deadly for Russia. Another thing which we need to mention is 
if there is a nuclear explosion in Ukraine, a lot of people in Russia will die if the wind blows the wrong way. So this is this is not uh, this is not something that uh, is uh, easy to do, even for Vladimir Putin. But you're right, Vladimir Putin makes mistakes. He sometimes overestimates his own invincibility. So I wouldn't bet my money on uh, on the scenario where Vladimir Putin does not ever use nuclear weapons. We've seen that he, he, has, he has surprised us on the downside many times. What is the probability, to the best of your understanding, what is the probability that Putin is going to use strategic nuclear weapons, not tactical strate- uh, nuclear weapons, which he uh, threatens time and again to use against Ukraine, but strategic nuclear weapons? Well, I, I think it's a, it's a, not a meaningful conversation because uh, strategic uh, nuclear weapons will destroy the place where you are and the place where I am. And so it doesn't really matter neither to you nor to me. Uh, in, in France, in France, France is the only country in, in, in the European continent which has uh, nuclear weapons. France has actually said that when Vladimir Putin first started to threaten Europe with nuclear weapons. French government said, we also have nuclear weapons. One thing I would emphasize, we've been surprised many times during this war that Russian military equipment doesn't function well. And I I would, this is something where I would actually bet my money. I think that probability that French nuclear weapons function is higher than probability that Russian nuclear weapons function. Yes, Russia has many more weapons, many more nuclear weapons, but uh, who knows? And uh, I hope that Vladimir Putin understands that very well. Unless he is lethally sick and doesn't care about his own life, I think he is not going to use strategic nuclear weapons. I see. What about people around Putin? At some point, you know, when, you know, uh, Putin got himself a substitute in Kremlin, uh, the name of the substitute was Dmitry Medvedev. And you were advisor to Mr. Medvedev. In fact, you know, gossip went that you wrote one of the most uh, one of the most beautiful speeches that Medvedev ever made public. So uh, now you know Medvedev turned into some sort of a monster who is you know writing on internet all kind of you know awful things about the neighboring countries of the former Soviet Union, you know, promising to conquer Kazakhstan, you know, and of course, you know, nuclear, uh, uh, nuclear war. But what do you think? People, people who surround Putin, are they ready? And you know, and I know that the absolute majority of them are dollar billionaires or millionaires. Uh, I don't think that anyone uh, around Putin has less than $1 million, right? Right. So do you think that they spent, they worked so damn hard to steal that much, and now they're going to to, uh, allow for all this wealth to to be turned into the nuclear waste? Do you think they will allow Putin to, uh, to strike the button? So you're right uh, um, in many ways. Uh, I would just correct you. I never was employed by Mr. Medvedev. I did talk to his advisors who worked for him, to his aides, uh, but I never worked uh, formally for Russian government. So on um, on uh, people around Putin, yes, there are many dollar millionaires and billionaires around him. There are dollar millionaires who used to be billionaires, whose wealth was destroyed by this war. So. Uh, instead of being billionaires, they're now millionaires, right? And they're I extremely so unhappy. Sorry right for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they're extremely unhappy. They're extremely unhappy. Um, also, it's not clear. It's not clear whether officers down the chain of command will actually execute the order. Um, it's not clear whether Minister of Defense and the Chief of General Staff will uh, execute the order because in order to launch nuclear weapons, you need pretty much turn several keys at the same time. So it's not just one person who can do that. And uh, and, uh, many people will just say, look, he's gone crazy. Uh, He's going to kill us all. And in that sense, you're right. There is a probability that his order will not be implemented. There is also a chance that he will be stopped before that 
because uh, you rightly said nobody's happy and there are some people who are additional unhappy in addition to losing wealth these people are also unhappy that he didn't deliver a victory right so he's been telling them look i need this billion here those hundred billions here to build the army i will build the second army in the world and now it turns out that it's actually second army in ukraine and uh, this is what people in the military don't like at all they understand that vladimir putin built a system where money which was going to reinforce the army was stolen and if anything ended up in offshore bank account. And in that sense, in that sense, I think a uh, number of people around him who are unhappy and may not be willing to fulfill his orders, actually quite high. So this is something where you are the specialist working on KGB and so-called Silaviki. I understand uh, there's, they're, they're thinking much less so. As you rightly said, I probably talked to people uh, who are involved in economic policy rather than in KGB, but who knows? I think uh, what we are sure of is nobody's happy about what's going on right now, either because the war is not won or because the wealth is destroyed or because of both. On the scale, on the scale of one to 10, so what's the probability that Putin will stop a nuclear war? Again, <laughs> one to <laughs> ten, I give you on a very short scale. Listen, <laughs> no, I think, I think, I think, uh, I think both you and I will survive a tactical nuclear strike, which will probably kill hundreds, hundreds of thousands of people in Ukraine and in Russia. Uh, but uh, again, in, uh, evaluating this probability, I just, I just, I just can't speculate about this. The reason for that is. When we do quantitative analysis, we usually use model based on past data, on similar episodes in history. Right. This is an episode which has never happened. Never a permanent member of U.S. Security Council armed with nuclear weapons started such a horrible war and indeed is threatening the world with extermination. So in that sense, our quantitative models just don't give us anything and my um, subjective feelings are as good as uh, subjective feeling of any any uh, any person in the street. Okay, you just returned back from uh, New York, uh, so uh, you mentioned the United Nations. Uh, Russia, Russian Federation is a member uh, of the Security Council. Basically, uh, Russia is one of those countries who control the decisions of the uh, United Nations. How or not it's possible that the country that started the war of choice, the war of aggression in other its neighbor, in which is threatened the world with a nuclear uh, strike, it keeps its place as a member of the Security Council? What's going to happen with the United Nations and the Security Council in the near future? That's a great question. That's exactly another example of unprecedented um, unprecedented uh, outcomes. So you're right. Uh, the previous aggression we can remember is invasion of Iraq of Saddam Hussein in Kuwait, where Security Council uh, announced uh, Iraq to be an aggressor. Iraq was uh, defeated militarily. And then Iraq for 30 years was repaying reparations ordered by United Nations. Iraq was repaying reparations to Kuwait. Russia has a veto power within UN. Russia will not agree under Putin. Russia will not agree to pay uh, reparations. Russia will veto any decision to send uh, peacekeepers to Ukraine. And so all of that is, is horrible. How we can reform UN, I don't know. And you're right, uh, if you have an aggressor uh, who holds a veto power, the organization is completely stuck. And in that sense, in that sense, yes, the whole purpose of United Nations is undermined. Probably, you know, my last question before we turn to the question from the audience is uh, in regard with, is about Gazprom or, uh, you know, to be precise about, you know, Nord Stream one and two out of four uh, pipes 
three were destroyed by some strange explosion. For one, to the best of your, I understand we're gossiping now, but still, uh, 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 people say this is, it is Russia, which used its ability to put, you know, what they call peep through the pipes, it's the name, and to blow up from inside. Uh, other hypothesis, it is Ukraine, which blew up the pipes. And the third hypothesis that it's United States who decided to blow up the state, the pipes in order to prevent Europe even from thinking about the Russian gas. What is your, uh, what is your guess? Well, I think, I think here uh, the analysis is very straightforward. You correctly mentioned that some people accuse Ukraine. Ukraine doesn't have Navy. Ukraine doesn't have submarines. So <laughs> there is no way Ukraine could have done that. Maybe there is a secret Ukrainian project uh, developing uh, submarines or, or divers or something like this, but this is really, really deep sea. So I just don't understand how that could have been done by Ukraine, simply because Ukraine doesn't have technology. So the other, uh, the other option is United States. And indeed you can see the discussions about, about uh, uh, US blowing it up. So it has a market for LNG. Now that uh, is technically possible. You, uh, US does have sub submarines, but uh, that is going against US allies. Uh, European countries are interested in buying gas through Nord Stream 1. If anything, it is Mr. Putin who's been playing with this blackmailing game in the recent months, stopping supplies through Nord Stream 1. Nord Stream 2 is sanctioned, so we are now talking about Nord Stream 1. Uh, and Europe would be outraged if they learned that this were, this were U.S., and uh, it is very clear now that things like this cannot be kept secret in the US. So US government would know that this information would eventually be publicized. And this is a crime. It's, a, it's, a, it's something that uh, US government officials would go to jail for. And of course, it will destroy transatlantic alliance. And if anything, we now see how precious this alliance is. And so I'm pretty sure that no reasonable US government official would do that. And to carry out an operation like this, you need to involve many agencies. And so there are frictions between agencies. And so somebody there would actually leak this to the press. So it's impossible for political economy reasons. So which leaves us with Russia, which has both motive and um, uh, capability. Some people would say, Mr. Putin doesn't benefit from that. But Mr. Putin has been playing with this uh, 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 game of, we don't have the turbine, we had a leak in Nord Stream 1. I don't know what, but I will not just sell you stuff. Uh, I will not sell you gas through Nord Stream 1. That's been happening for the last couple of months. And yes, it's not in the interest of Russia to blow up Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2. But as we just discussed, Mr. Putin does a lot of stuff, which for us looks absurd and definitely contradicts Russia's interests. So by uh, elimination of other alternatives, I think we can only arrive at uh, Russia who's done that. Okay, thank you. I reserve a possibility to ask you another question at the end of our conversation. But first, you know, I would like to ask our audience to, to write the questions or if there's questions in the guest, please introduce yourself. My name is Gany Kotsonis. I'm a historian at NYU. Um, and I, it's always nice to hear from you because, as I think as your host mentioned, you are one of the greater, greater political economists. And that's the kind of question I'd like to ask you. So about nuclear war. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> Not nuclear war. About economics. So we find ourselves in a situation where we have the short term, and I, and I agree with you that a good part of what Russia has been doing recently, 14 if you prefer, has been in terms of short term interest. So, for example, blowing up Nord Stream would have a short term gain for Russia, but only a short term gain. Uh, because it would spike prices in natural gas, you know, but, you know, it's possible. But in the medium term and in the long term, Russia faces constrained circumstances. And this is what you know better than anybody. Um, uh, so correct me if I'm wrong, but in the layout, how I understand Russia's economic situation now, 
but we're dealing with a country which has constraints mainly because 70 something percent of its exports are petrochemicals, right, or hydrocarbons. 50% of the budget is also hydrocarbons, and 25% of GDP or thereabouts is also hydrocarbons. So anything happens to the price of oil and natural gas, well, it affects Russia in a very direct way. So with prices of oil going, the price of oil and natural gas went up right, during COVID, and then with the outbreak of the war, and the war had the effect of increasing Russian revenue because the price of oil went up, right, thanks to the war, although it had already been going up. And now prices are slowly going down, and we expect to go further down. So Russia was able to shore up the ruble thanks to the exports, as best as I can understand. It. Um, but that's going to stop at some point. And at some point, uh, as the United States production kicks in especially, um, but not only the United States, then prices we expect to go down below 80. Right, right now they're below 90. And that's below 100, which it was, I think, last week and all that. So this is an ongoing. So at some point, not only because of the sanctions, but because of world prices, Russia's going to have to face choices like, how do I pay for an army? Um, you get part of the answer to that. Uh, how do I pay for pensions? How do I pay for state employees? How do I pay for infrastructure? How do I pay for all the things I don't manufacture, which is just about everything, right? And so how do you see this unfolding? Yanis, I think it's a great question and you're right. You're perfectly right. And the numbers you were given um, are mostly describing a pre-war situation. Actually, when the war has started, uh, we saw that Russian economy was hit even harder. So non-oil taxes declined to a greater extent. And the last detailed budget data, which date back to April, since then Russian government stopped pu publishing detailed budget data. So, so this data suggests that uh, oil and gas play even higher role in, in the Russian budget. Now, uh, short-term versus long-term, Putin needs to do something in the very, very short term. The real sanctions, oil embargo by Europe and oil price cap by G7 and Europe will kick in in December. And they will be rolled out over two or three months, but this is, this is the perspective Putin's uh, facing. So his strategy until recently and probably now is, I want to freeze Europe uh, and convince Europe to remove sanctions. I honestly think it's not going to happen Putin was waiting for outcome of Italian elections. And uh, in Italian elections, as you know, a right-wing party, an extreme right-wing party won the elections, but not the one which loves Putin, the one which loves NATO, right? And, and so he lost that one, he lost that one. And uh, in, that, in that respect, he needs more allies and it's not clear where he will get the politicians that are ready to remove sanctions. So gas matters for Europe during the winter. And gas prices went up. Oil prices are coming down, as you rightly said. And actually, Russian oil prices are coming down even faster because of the expectation of oil price cap, which will be introduced. Today, India and China are paying much less than for non-Russian oil. So there is a gap between Brent and Euros. Um, uh, it used to be a couple of dollars. Now it's more like $30, $25-$30, depending on the day. So. Russia is lacking money, and indeed there, is, there was a budget deficit already in July, a huge budget deficit. And um, so Putin wants to do something quickly. Now, these things are important. So if you look at data on how much more European households pay for guns, uh, on average, the increases twofold. There are countries where increases threefold and even fourfold. And so, Governments understand how painful it is and governments roll out fiscal support packages. And then there are countries where governments spend 2% of GDP, 3% of GDP, and then 4% of GDP on supporting poor households. So all of that is not comparable to COVID times when those packages were much bigger. And so in that sense, uh, I, I have no doubt that European governments and countries will manage. But uh, Putin's bet is this break the will and the unity of the of the European governments to maintain this oil embargo, which kicks in in December. After, after that, Yanis, you're completely right. Putin will face a much bigger fiscal problem. No money to pay soldiers, teachers, pensioners, bureaucrats. My guess is he will choose to pay riot police, bureaucrats, but not pensioners. And so if pensioners take to the street, uh, 
right police will beat them up. But uh, to what extent that will hold, I don't know. This is the first time in Putin's history when he will face a major fiscal deficit without having a reserve fund, without having sovereign reserves. Why? Because those were sanctioned on the third day of the war. So I think it's going to be difficult for him. And at that time, nuclear strike is again plausible. So, because he has no other choice, right? So these things are becoming really, really uncertain, unchartered, and uh, we should worry about this. But I think uh, there is no other road to peace. Ukraine is not going to surrender. Ukrainian government will never sign a peace agreement where it loses land relative to pre-war borders. And so this war will continue until Putin has no, no soldiers to grab more land. So this is going to be a difficult war. I would give you, since you're, you're a historian, you're better suited to predict uh, uh, what uh, happens in the battleground, uh, but you also know very well what happened in Korea. Korean war has actually not ended. Uh, there is no peace agreement. There is a DMZ, there is a demarcation line, but uh, formally there is no peace agreement. And maybe something like this will happen and Russia will become a sanctioned North Korea while Ukraine will start reconstruction. And Putin will continue launching missiles to undermine reconstruction. When this uh, Korean scenario happened, I don't know, in two months, in half a year, in a year, but what is important, Putin, to continue the active war, high intensity war, he needs a lot of money. So if you look at how much he spends on, on military, it's 50% uh, more than in normal years. So he needs cash to send soldiers, to produce more, uh, more art uh, artillery munitions, and all of that he needs to spend a lot of money on. And, uh, and if he has a fiscal deficit, at some point he will run out of cash. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, please. Yes. Um, hi, Christina. I'm an administrator at NYU Center for Social Media and Politics. Um, I actually had a very similar question, which is kind of going back to something you talked about at the beginning, which was, uh, you know, why Putin was going deeper, pushing deeper into this for sort of an imperial gain and, and the desire to conquer this land. Um, and I'm wondering, because, you know, we just talked about, of course, the fiscal costs of doing that. But also there's, I can only imagine, extensive damage to the very land that he's trying to conquer. There's incredible like infrastructural and systemic damage to Ukraine. Um, and of course, many lives lost and Russia is losing military resources and, and soldiers. And I'm wondering if you think that there will ever be a point where all of those costs will outweigh what he perceives to be the gain of conquering this land or if it will just escalate to the point of nuclear war, I guess. Um, yeah, this, yeah, we don't know, but. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think the right answer, we don't know. Yeah. And I think, uh, I think uh, now he's cornered and we don't know how he gets out of this corner uh, because Ukraine is now gaining territory. And so my only, my only answer, if you, if you want a, a scenario where a nuclear war doesn't happen is this Korean scenario where neither side can progress and so de facto the war turns into a low intensity conflict or a Korean demarcation. Uh, so so this, is, this is the only scenario I see where we don't have nuclear war. Um, but uh, so what is an illusion? So if Putin offers a peace deal to Ukraine where he gets to keep some of the occupied territory, no Ukrainian president will be able to sign this deal. If Zelensky signs that, which I can't imagine. But if he does sign this, he will be impeached next day. So I think, I think there is no peace deal except for Putin gives up all the land he grabbed this year. But in that scenario, he cannot go back because nobody will support him. He destroyed the economy. Tens of thousands of Russians died. Nothing gained. So this is something that I just can't imagine. But... Uh, we are, as I said, in uncharted territory. So I, I, I don't know what's going to happen. Yes, please. I'm Anne Lounsbury. I'm in the Department of Russian Slavic Studies at NYU. I work on literature. Um, 
once Putin is gone, because he has to be gone at some point, um, can you foresee a scenario where the people who replace him or the person who replaces him want to walk this back um, and, uh, you know, basically get out of the war? Or does it seem to you more likely that whoever follows him will continue with this? So again, we don't know. There are several scenarios. One scenario is, is he's replaced by even br more brutal person or by a collegial body like military junta or KGB junta. Now, the, the Putin's entourage is built in a way that it only works with Putin exactly because he didn't want to create a potential successor, potential alternative. So these people don't like each other. And so I don't see how they can run it for a long time. I may be wrong, that may be a, a system which continues to be very brutal for a long time. There is a difference between a brutal system with and without Putin. Putin still has some legitimacy. Putin, before the war, in last independent polls, uh, before the war, he would get at least 30% in the vote. If you look at uh, Levada polls in September and October before the war, these were pretty much the last independent polls, right? They would ask a question, whom would you vote for if you vote for president now? 30% of Russians would say we would vote for Putin. Uh, would they vote for Mr. Patrushev, Mr. Patrushev's junior? Um, no, there is no legitimacy. There is no track record of, of success. So it's, uh, it's uh, the, the same corrupt, brutal general. Why would you vote for him? And so there, there are two questions here. One, one, two opportunities here. One, these generals try to kill each other because you run the country, you're a corrupt, brutal general. I'm a corrupt, brutal general. I'm no worse than you. I don't have 30% of the vote and you don't. So they, they will, we'll try to kill each other. So uh, that's how military juntas uh, uh, function, especially when they don't have an ideology, when they don't have honor code and so on. The other scenario is somebody comes after Putin and says, I want actually to build legitimacy. I want to be protected from another general, or if I'm civilian, I want to be protected from a general by some popular support. And for that, I need to give people something. I need to improve their well-being. But to improve well-being, I need to remove sanctions. And so I walk back, uh, some, some aggression. I talk to the West, I talk to Ukraine. Some of that will probably require in, uh, running at least um, seemingly independent elections, releasing political prisoners. So, so there is an optimistic scenario of divestment of this thing. But uh, there is no guarantee. And indeed, there is no guarantee that Putin is replaced. Putin may be replaced by somebody even crazier who will say, uh, why do we need the world where Russia lost the war? We need to finish this world, so let's launch the nuclear attack. So we don't know, we don't know. But if you want an optimistic scenario, there exists an optimistic scenario, and it's actually quite logical. If you want to uh, build popular support, the way you do it, but it's by building the economy, and for that you need to remove sanctions. Thank you. Anybody else here, or we will turn to uh, to the people from uh, the web. Okay, uh, um, uh, Sergey, uh, Alex Longstaff. In fact, you know, uh, you just mentioned uh, public opinion polls. Uh, do you find the ongoing public opinion polling data of the World Center believable, or has it no longer become possible to gauge Russian public opinion through polls? Thanks. Well, I, uh, I think, I think um, the polls are now much less believable because people just don't respond to polls after, after those laws that uh, if you don't call this war, if you call this war a war, you go to jail for many years. So people just don't pick up the phone, refuse to speak to pollsters. That's absolutely normal. Even before the war, there was a bias. Some people would not want to say the truth to the pollsters. And you can actually measure this bias by looking at what's called least experiments. But by now, it's, it's just, I think it's un, uninformative. People who are against Putin just don't want to say that. So it's falsification of preferences uh, described by Timur Kuran uh, in the case of Soviet system. So I think, I think it's, um, we shouldn't, we shouldn't pretend that we can believe those polls. And I'm not accusing Levada. Uh, it's just, it's just the, yeah, 
imagine running a poll in, in Stalin's Soviet Union. Especially with the, with the response uh, rate 5%. You know, it's unbelievable. Yeah, exactly. 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 Uh, Vlad Malinsky, uh, how do you compare today's situation to 1938? I guess that's Munich and the Cuban Missile Crisis in uh, of 1962. I think it's an excellent question. I'm not a specialist in Cuban Missile Crisis, and I think the the end of the world is much farther away at the moment for the reasons we discussed than in 1962. But 1938 and 39, I think it's a good analogy with a difference that I think 1938 is comparable to 2014, the annexation of Crimea, the first invasion of Putin. The today's invasion is more similar to 39, 41, or even 42, the Wannsee conference when uh, German government officials started to talk about final solution of Jewish question. I, I would remind you that Mr. Putin also used those words. He talked about uh, final solution of um, the Ukrainian question. He also used the words like national uh, traitors. And, uh, and all of that is um, rhetoric that we can recognize from 1942. So, but uh, yes, I think, I think this is a good comparison. We agree with you. Uh, uh, hardly, uh, hardly Beza, what is this war doing to Russia's uh, education system? Well, nothing good. Nothing good, of course. Uh, people are running away and, and people who are staying are afraid to speak out. So I think, I think it's, a, it's a disaster. And, uh, and uh, I hope some of these people uh, will return after Putin is gone. But uh, at the moment, uh, the war is destroying Russian universities, especially in social science, of course, but also in natural sciences, because when the country is cut off global economy, you cannot order equipment, you cannot order materials, you cannot work together with your co-authors, you cannot really travel. So all of that has been destroyed. Maxim Matusevich, speaking of alternatives, what in the world, what, what in the world has happened to Dmitry Medvedev, who has now emerged as this unhinged anti-Western hawk? What's his game? Is he trying to turn for the scene of abstaining on Libya? What is his role in this unfolding tragedy? Uh, yes, Maxim, I fully agree with you. Mr. Medvedev wants to pretend he's a hawk. Uh, Maybe he convinced himself that he's a hawk, but he wants to be sure that nobody accuses him to be more liberal, uh, less anti-Western than the uh, members of Security Council and Mr. Patrushev and so on. He wants to send a message, don't repress me. I'm not going to talk to American diplomats or American intelligence officers. Yes, I had some contacts with Americans 15 years ago, but no longer. I really hate them because I think he's afraid of being arrested or killed. What is his role in this tragedy? I, my answer would be no role. I think he matters uh, zero percent in, in what's going on in Russia. He's completely disconnected from decision making. Uh, Alexander Prosviryakov, I guess. In, practice term, in practical terms, what can Russians uh, abroad who can't return back to Russia do to help bring an end to Putin's regime? Obviously, taking the streets to demonstrate against Putin doesn't have any meaningful effect. Well, this is a simple question indeed. It's very hard to overthrow Putin being in Paris or New York. Demonstrating in Paris or New York is a good idea to show the rest of the world that Russians are against the war. This is extremely important. Uh, regarding, uh, regarding other things, um, if you have... Uh, uh, resources, you should help Ukrainians, you should uh, help Ukrainian refugees, but also Ukrainians in Ukraine. And uh, you should also try to help uh, anti-Putin Russians running away because uh, emigrating is not easy and emigrating within a day is even harder. So I think I think there are many things you can do. Um, but, uh, but overall, of course, you shouldn't count on your work to overthrow Putin tomorrow. But uh, Russia will exist after Putin. Geography cannot be removed, uh, can, cannot be changed. And so there will be Russia, maybe different borders, who knows? But there'll be Russia and it will be rebuilt. And uh, it will be rebuilt by Russians. And so what we can 
helped to do is to make sure that there are enough anti-Putin, pro-European, pro-democratic Russians uh, who uh, survive. And unfortunately, we are talking about survival. And so if you support these people, you're contributing to future of the West, future of Europe, and future of Ukraine. Because we are all interested in making sure that Russia, which is a neighbor of Ukraine, neighbor of Europe, in the future will be a free and peaceful country. It's already 11 p.m. in Paris. So two last questions, please, Sergei. And uh, uh, that will be, you know, uh, that will be the end of our today's more, most interesting meeting. Joseph Bradley, uh, is Putin really motivated by the desire to conquer land as land? Is the Donbass uh, Rust Belt that valuable as land? Isn't land really symbolic of dominance of post Soviet space? Ukrainian threatens Russian dominance, and the loss of Ukrainian diminishes Russia. Of course, it's symbolic. It's completely symbolic. There is no economic value. And the fact that Putin destroys cities completely, raises them to the ground, shows to you that it's not the economic infrastructure, but the symbolic value, ability to come back to Russia and said, we have restored uh, uh, our rights to East Ukraine or fully, uh, full Ukraine and so on and so forth. So of course it's symbolic, it's about imperialism, it's about <clears throat> imperial nostalgia. Uh, the last question from Irina, can you comment on how the other erstwhile Soviet countries but Ukraine and Russia will fare now and after the war, several Asian republics, Baltics, Caucasus, Moldova, etc., which are now strained by various refugee flows and economic dependence crisis. Well, uh, uh, these are different uh, cases, as Leo Tolstoy said famously in Anna Karenina, each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. So this war will hit everybody, including US and including France. It's already been a big impact on the global economy. But on Russia's neighbors, of course, every country will be hit in the neighborhood, uh, but in different ways. Moldova will join the EU probably in 10 years, maybe in 20, who knows. Um, uh, Central Asian republics uh, will be non-democratic countries, uh, which, uh, which, will, be, which uh, will now be much more dependent on China, because with a weaker Russia, there will be no counterweight to China. Uh, so it's, uh, it's going to be not easy as well. Uh, Caucasus, nothing is changing except for everybody knows that Russia will not be able to defend Armenia. Uh, and uh, Baltics will be Baltics. Uh, these are NATO countries. These are EU members. Uh, they will suffer economically. They're already suffering economically, but uh, they'll be fine. And uh, I, see, I see no threat of Putin invading NATO at the moment. If anything, uh, being in Paris or New York is more dangerous regarding nuclear strike because as we talked about it, uh, US and France have nuclear weapons while Baltics don't. Okay, thank you so much. However, I cannot round up this uh, conversation unless we mention our friends, Alexei Navalny, Ilya Yashin, Vladimir Karamurza, who are currently sitting in jail and they basically paying the price that all of us, uh, you know, basically they're paying this price for us because we are in a comfortable environment of United States and France and other countries across the globe. And they're sitting, uh, Alexei Navalny is sitting in the high uh, security uh, penal colony in Vladimirsk region. Uh, Ilya Yashin in Butyrka uh, jail in a, uh, in a cell uh, nine s uh, square meters uh, big with four with three other uh, inmates and Vladimir Kromosai sitting in another um, jail in Moscow as well. All uh, uh, the Wildly serving nine year uh, term. Uh, Yashin and Kromosa uh, haven't been sentenced yet. So we, we, it's our obligation to talk about them and try to release them and to help them in any way we can. But one thing that I, I, I should ask you, you know, before it's all these tragic events unveiled, before the invasion of Ukraine, 
Uh, there were lots of talks about the time when Alexei Navalny was going to get released from jail. He would become he was going to become president of the Russian Federation, immediately conduct a parliamentary reform and turn Russia into parliamentary democracy, and you are going to serve as a prime minister of Russia. <laughs> That's where our dreams and hopes <laughs> absolutely seriously. We were talking about that. We were hoping it's going to happen. So do you think you and I were going to be exiled for good or do you expect that we're going to meet in Russia, you're going to be prime minister of Russia? Uh, so one thing I know is uh, never say never, my life has turned in many unexpected ways, but we did not discuss the job of prime minister with Alexei Navalny, if that, if that helps. So we did. You... With Navalny, okay, yeah. we did, that's great, but we didn't. Uh, but uh, you and I are younger than Mr. Putin. We probably, we have a lot of stress, but he has much more stress. And I think, I think uh, we are going to survive him. And then if you want to travel back to Russia, you will. And I will also be happy to go back to Russia. So we'll see. So I think, I think uh, this is the person who's been running Russia for many, many years, but uh, he's mortal. And indeed, uh, we as younger people are going to outlive him. So. Thank you so much, Professor Sergei Guriev of Sian Sport. Thank you very much for taking part in the series and for your willingness that late uh, night in Paris to speak to the audience of the Jondos Center for Advanced Study of Russia of New York University. Thank you very much, Sergei. Thank you very much, Evgenia. Thank you, all friends in uh, Jordan Center. Thank you.